Hello there, everyone, and welcome back to One Idea Away. You know, as you know, on this show, we really like to peel back the layers, meaning that we'll look at certain topics, certain themes, certain issues and circumstances that are going on in our lives and look for how that presents a portal for us to go through an access point for us to go through and really begin to actually understand what's going on underneath our lives. What has us seeing our situations, our life situations, uh, our circumstances, the way that we do, and how is it that we can begin to get to understand more about who we are and how we are. You know, it's one of the things that I think is really interesting is that through all my years of schooling, uh, I never had a class that taught me about who I am or what I am in terms of how it is that I function. And it's, it's become a really major interest of mine to really understand what makes us tick. Uh, why do we look at the world the way that we do? Why do we perceive things the way that we do? And how is it through this understanding, we can actually start to experience life differently. As I've gone on this journey and as I've gone down this path, it's opened up certainly a greater sense of both self-awareness as more of a macro level awareness of things that are going on. It's opened me up to better understanding and compassion for others. Uh, it's opened up all sorts of different paths. And so I'm constantly looking for other ways that we can uh, kind of sow the seeds of this conversation into our audience, into your lives, so that you can start to recognize this stuff and see how the situations of your life may be presenting you a portal, an opening for you to see life very, very differently and bring it into deeper connection, deeper alignment with who you really truly are. Well, as part of my own journey, as part of my own studies, I took, uh, I deepened my own mindfulness and contemplative practices several years ago. And it was through that work, it was through that study that I got introduced to the work of Dr. Stephen Porges. Now, this is one of those fields uh, and one of those discoveries that when we get into, yes, some of the science of it, we're going to go a little bit there. We'll get a little geeky as it were. Uh, but I promise you the relevancy to our everyday lives is just extraordinary. And so it was as I started to dive into that work and recognize the implications across the way that we relate to one another, the implications for the reasons why do we seem to perceive the way that we perceive? Why do we get stressed the way that we get stressed? This had implications across the whole of it. And when you understand some of it, you understand what cues to pick up on and how we can bring ourselves to safer places and safer states of being, it really changes the way that we can relate. It changes the, even the decision-making that, that we have. And so I wanted to dive into this today, and we're fortunate enough that we get to dive in with the pioneer, Dr. Stephen Porges, of polyvagal theory. Let me give you the, the proper introduction uh, for Dr. Porges. Dr. Stephen Porges is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where he is the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. He's a professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina, professor emeritus at both University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as the University of Maryland. He has served as the president of the Society for Psychophysiological Research and the Federation of Association in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. He's a former recipient of the uh, National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Development Award, published more than 300 peer review articles, and in 1994, he first proposed and pioneered the polyvagal theory, a theory that links the evolution of mammalian autonomic nervous system to social behavior and emphasizes the importance of physiological state in the expression of behavioral problems and psychiatric disorders. I promise you, we are going to bring that down. Uh, you can understand it a lot more clearly, but it's, it's fundamentally important to the way that we operate. Uh, he's just truly an innovator. He put out his book, The Polyvagal Theory, uh, Neuro, uh, Neurophysiology Foundations of Emotions, Attachment, Communication, and Self-Regulation. That may give you a cue as to the importance of all of this work. And one other development that he is behind, which I did want to mention because I find it absolutely fascinating, is he's also the creator of a music-based intervention called the Safe and Sound Protocol, which is currently used by more than 1,400 therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, reduce hearing sensitivities, improve language processing, uh, state regulation, as well as spontaneous social engagement. Uh, so with all of that, and with all of these accomplishments, the very distinguished guest, Dr. Stephen Porges. Steve, thank you so much for being here on One Idea Away. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Now let's get into what we can <laughs> communicate, because really what we're both all about is communication. How can we translate ideas into practice and how can we be helpful to the word I like using or the phrase is optimizing the human experience. That's, I, I like that one. 
Uh, let, let me ask you, as, as we get into exactly that, communicating what, what all of this is about, one of the things I'm just always interested in and, and is usually a good starting point for us is why this work for you? Meaning I'm curious, you know, personally, what was it that drew you in? Because there, there's always seems to be something in somebody's journey that draws them into what they do. Let's see, now we get into the issue of the narrative. <laughs> and, and the narrative is how we glue our life together, how we make sense of it. There are a lot of different narratives that I can structure. But to be more consistent with actually your background and what you're interested in, I'd rather go back to when I was a, a 10 or 11 year old and start to play the clarinet. <laughs> and basically learned through playing the clarinet how to regulate physiological state. Okay. And so the journey really is all going to be about the power of regulating physiological state and the importance of physiological state as that magic or critical intervening variable between the world that we live in and our responses to that world. Hmm. And so going back to give this some, in a sense, concrete examples, you know, I was an adolescent. I was playing the clarinet. I was actually ended up being quite good at it. I was the second solo chair in the state of New Jersey by the time I graduated high school. So that was, in a sense, the sense of accomplishment. Now, that's an all, that's an interesting journey because you, sure. when you're young and you have a sense of accomplishment, it helps you buffer a lot of these other evaluative things. I was also ran track and I was reasonably good enough to get a track scholarship. So you now have these two levels of evaluation, music, which is a consensus evaluation, and you have track, which it doesn't matter what form you have, if you win, you win. So it, it's concrete. And that prepared me or buffered me for the capricious world of academics and the capricious <laughs> world of politics within science. Mm -hmm. The ability to, in a sense, feel confident enough to promote a, in a sense, a, a novel theory, you know, a different way of viewing the world, yeah. even though most of my colleagues would rather find consistency in the world that was rewarding them and enabling them to function. But mm -hmm. going, going back to the young fellow who played the clarinet, what was the clarinet playing all about? What do you do when you play the clarinet? Well, you exhale slowly. And of course, 40 years later, we know that exhaling slowly is really a way of increasing the vagal regulation of our heart and calming us down, turning off our sympathetics. What else do you do? You listen and you make, uh, there's a muscle around the mouth that you use for your embouchure. And what, again, 40 years later, what did we learn? we learned that the muscles, the striated muscles of the face and head are linked to the vagal regulation of our heart. They're part of our calming system, they're right. part of our ingestive system, and they're part of our social communication system. Mm -hmm. And what else did we learn? We learned that when you listen, listening is not hearing. Listening is an active process. And listening also recruits muscles of the face. It recruits the middle ear muscles. And so we are able to pull out human voice or in this case, the clarinet, which is human voice, same frequency band. And now we can deal with the, the subtle intonations of this. So right. the, where I moved with this, uh, again, a retrospective narrative, is all I would needed to do was deconstruct what I did as a teenager playing the clarinet, and there would be polyvagal theory. But there would also be pranayama yoga. It would yeah. be there as well. So now we see an ancient tradition and a more modern neuroscience tradition basically overlapping on the functional level of deconst right. you deconstruct what you're doing when you're playing the clarinet. Right. So I used to give the story of wind instruments as calming. Mm -hmm. And when I put that into my talks, the people that get the most agitated by that are the other musicians who are not wind instrument musicians. <laughs> They're the percussionists and the string players. Uh, and what they say is, we do the same thing. We breathe and we attend, we do the same thing. And my, my retort is, but with a wind instrument, you have no choice. Yeah. You have to do that. So it's an instructional uh, neural exercise of going through. So the narrative okay. is that when you're a teenager and you're maturing and you're going through major physiological shifts in body size, body awareness, and everything for a teenager is social context. How do you regulate your state? So if we want to, in a sense, put this in the reality of the world that you're in, 
that is we're in a world where our bodies get disrupted. Where would it be more disruptive than during adolescent period of time, especially for a male? I don't want to be too uh, sexual, uh, sexual bias on this, but you know, males are going through major hormonal changes that often get them into lots of trouble. Mm -hmm. And their bodies just are not at that point with the shifts in hormones easily calm. And I'm there playing the clarinet. I'm regulating those situations. Right. So I learned at an early age, even though I didn't know the neurophysiological pathways, that slow exhalation and attentiveness and utilizing the facial muscles, which we would normally use in a dyadic interaction with another person, mm. a face-to-face, -face, a reciprocal, uh, even talking or playing with another person would have some of the same benefits. So I started understanding uh, what worked for me, even though I didn't understand the neural mechanisms. Sure. I had to mature into that. So then one of the, one of the things actually that's interesting, because I've, I've heard you speak about the influence of uh, specifically woodwind uh, instruments yeah. in playing music on, uh, in the relationship with bagel theory. Uh, I, I also, I, I played the saxophone for a okay. number of years, not particularly well, but I did play it. Uh, and, uh, but one of the things I heard you mention in it is that, with playing a woodwind instrument, it's good for self-regulation, but that there's this other thing that needs to occur with other people, yeah. right? Yeah. That, that needs to create longer regulation. So I want to go there. Maybe if you could, we could just pause to give you a moment to uh, try to give the short version of what polyvagal theory you know, truly is. But then I'd love to talk about this this inter interplay with relationships. That okay. Yeah, it, I, and, and make sure on. we don't make sure we don't forget to go there because it's yeah. critical. Yep. Okay, so polyvagal theory really uh, provides an explanation of how physiological states affect our psychological and behavioral uh, states and activities, okay. and our health. So what we learn from polyvagal theory is that our, the neural regulation of our autonomic nervous system, the part of our nervous system that is basically mostly automatic, that regulates the organs within our body, that system changed with evolution as of vertebrates. So I focus on vertebrates. Mammals are a vertebrate and humans are a mammal. And I focus on the transition from ancient extinct reptiles to modern type mammals. Mm -hmm. And what happens is uh, mammals require co-regulation. They need to be nurtured at birth. They need to be protected. They need safety to function. Their nervous system is tuned to detect risk and vulnerability. And that turns off the physiology that enables us to grow health growth and restoration. So mm -hmm. polyvagal theory identified three different evolutionary stages of autonomic uh, evolution, or how the neural regulation of the autonomic nervous system changed. Okay. And it started with a very ancient autonomic nervous system that really uh, basically had one uh, defensive mode. It shut us down. It reduced metabolic activity. But when it wasn't shutting down, it supported the homeostatic function of our body. And in polyvagal theory, this is identified and called the dorsal vagal uh, pathways because we still have it as mammals. So we, we basically inherit it from our extinct relatives, this circuit. And when we inherit things, we use them in slightly different ways. So it's not like everything's exact. But you'll recognize this in people who have survived trauma. Yeah. That is, this system shuts us down. This system can create defecation. And, and we have to understand where did it come from? If we can look at reptiles, reptiles under great fear will defecate because it reduces metabolic demand mm. and they will immobilize or go underwater and be there for a couple hours because their brains are small. They don't need the oxygen. Now, this already translates to many human experiences that the reaction to trauma can often result in people fainting, losing muscle tone, and later on, if they have multiple incidents of trauma, they may functionally adapt to that by merely dissociating, not being in their body, uh, so that the body doesn't go into the same risk of totally shutting down. Right. So these have very powerful adaptive functions. The next evolutionary stage is the, a spinal sympathetic nervous system. And this enables in our world, 
what we have used that for. That gives us energy, exuberance, mobilization, uh, and it gives us the capacity on, on the defense mode to fight or to flee. But in a safety mode, it gives us the capacity to use those same systems to play. And now, how do we get into safe modes for both that uh, old vagus, that subdiaphragmatic, primarily going to organs below the diaphragm, and the sympathetic nervous system? How do we use them in both playful and healthful benefits? It's when the newest part of the autonomic nervous system, this social engagement system that I call, or an integrated social engagement system, which links the control of the striated muscles, the muscles of the face and head, including muscles of vocalizations, muscles of, in, of ingestion, muscles for listening, and facial muscles for cueing uh, our emotions, especially the orbital muscle around the eye, that we can tell when people are engaged with us and feeling good with us. This system is how we bring others into our world, but this system evolved with the connection to a newer vagal circuit to the heart, a, a more rapid one, a myelinated one, a stronger one that basically downregulates our defenses on the sympathetic nervous system and downregulates the dorsal, that old subdiaphragmatic vagus from defense. And now all our components of our autonomic nervous system function synergistically to maintain health and optimize our behavior. And we have words that we kind of use. We, when we utilize our sympathetics with the social engagement system, we call that play. And interestingly, when we in, you, utilize the social engagement system with the subdiaphragmatic one, we call it foreplay. So it becomes this, this capacity for bodies to be immobilized without fear. And to, so whether it's moments mm. of intimacy, which are not necessarily always sexual, but mm. moments in which we feel safe enough to allow our bodies to conform with another. And a projective test of that is how well do people give hugs? How well does a baby conform to your body when holding it? When the baby is safe, the body conforms. When a friend is safe with you, the bodies conform. Often people have histories and even though they want to give a hug, their bodies pull back. And so we start seeing this hierarchy of systems. Now, in the world of coaching, it's in a sense trying to deal with issues of how do we deal with the day-to-day -day stressful environment. But what do we mean by that? We mean that our sympathetic nervous system is now being recruited in defense, not in play. And what's the other thing that will be symptoms? We'll have what the medical community loves to call a term comorbid. We'll have comorbidities. One, we will have gut problems, extremely prevalent in people who experience stress. And we have terms for some of those gut problems, irritable bowel syndrome. These become natural products of an autonomic nervous system that is not in a state of social engagement and safety to promote normal homeostatic function. It's an autonomic nervous system that's being recruited to keep us alive in a defensive mode. So coaching is really to give people cues or learn that they need, their bodies need to turn off the defenses. The problem with that uh, notion of that we can teach people to turn off defenses is that it's outside the realm of cognitive awareness. Right. And this is where I came up with another I invented a word, I called it neuroception because I wanted to remove this issue of responsibility and intentionality of people who were anxious, people who were defensive. We don't want people to say that uh, to others, don't be anxious, don't be depressed, you have everything to live for. Listen, if that worked, the world would be just functioning great. It doesn't work. And if we go back to like your uh, history in contemplative work, mm -hmm we realize that if we are, what we're doing by telling people that they should be something, we're evaluating them yep. and we're not appropriately witnessing them. They're in the interaction to be witnessed, which really means in a very simple level, they want the other person to be present with them mm -hmm. and to respect their feelings, not for their feelings to be evaluated. Excellent. So. 
you bring up so many different areas we could dive into just even in that, in that uh, great explanation and, and, and understanding for us of, of polyvagal theory and the implications of this. I think one of the things I want to start to extract so that we can come back to that, that topic yeah. I was bringing back before, right, is I find it interesting, two things. One is part of where I started to go was thinking through what is it that triggers off that hierarchy, uh, the levels one, two, and three of, of right, the, uh, the shutdown response versus the sympathetic yeah. response, yeah. right, versus the social engagement. And part of what you then tied it to is the recognition of how important that feeling of safety is. And that with that feeling of safety, there are elements of even the, the earlier evolution of who we are that are the so-called more um, survivalistic uh, elements yeah. of, of our wiring that are actually really good for us, for, for things like intimacy and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's just, I, the reason why I bring that up is it's interesting because very often when we hear about some of the, uh, the so-called old lizard brain and, and those aspects of who we are, the, the earlier evolution of who we are, usually they're not talked about in a very positive manner. Yeah. It's only talked about of what problems it creates. Uh, yeah, There's actually some good in there too. And safety is, that, is a key piece. Tre tremendous part of uh, survival, adaptive survival mechanisms. And this is when we start to understand that. This is another... What I, I learned after I developed polyvagal theory, because it was a theory that provided these building blocks of human behavior. And what I started to learn was that it provided explanations for people who had survived uh, traumas. And when they got that explanation, they understood what their body was doing for them, not that their body had failed them. And so there's all, all these things that we kind of miss because we, we have this idea that we are in control of everything. Mm -hmm. And that's where people start getting uh, too strong a feeling of blame and shame as opposed to an appreciation of actually what their body is doing. Wow. So if we bring this back to what I was, I was mentioning before in terms of uh, playing a woodwind instrument uh, and what that, that breathing type of process uh, enables in us within self-regulation. The other aspect that, I, that, that I've heard you talk about before, which I just think is really interesting, is the importance of co-regulation, yeah. being so, in relationship with others. I'm going to take it back to playing the clarinet. So that right. was my meditative practice was playing the clarinet. Okay. But what was my feeling of enjoyment was playing in wind ensembles. Because what are you doing in a wind ensemble? You are making eye contact, you're, you're co-regulating, you're listening, you're compensating, you're shifting roles uh, of, of who is the lead. It's kind of a, it's a fun gamesy thing that is a, has a mutual dimension to it. Yeah. So what we really want to start saying is that we have to have certain physiological resources that enable us to co-regulate. But when we don't have those, others can reach out if they're skilled to provide the cues to our nervous system to enable our defenses, our physiological reactivity to become more dormant, to basically say, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. And this is really, so we often talk about friendships and uh, uh, talk, well, res let's even move this to rescue dogs, which is really mm -hmm. another kind of model because a lot of people uh, adopt do dogs that have had uh, basically trauma histories. I've got and two of them. <laughs> yeah, and, and you're aware of there's a little skittishness at times and there's a slow to warm, mm -hmm. but there's windows of opportunity where they will come close and accept the love and the reciprocity. So it's the body is shifting state on them. And as the state becomes more uh, co-regulated, meaning more safe, mm -hmm. then their behavior can be more interactive. Mm -hmm. So the part that we really want to say is that there are two aspects here. One is an aspect of self-regulation, which is very much of our society. Our right. society really says you need to you need to get hold of yourself. You need to regulate your behavior. But as a species, we evolved not to be primarily a self-regulator. We evolved to be a co-regulator in both giving to others and receiving from others. So our bodies are always looking for the cues. Uh, so I have a metaphor I use, and that is, the metaphor I use is that um, 
for the older people who may be watching, they may know about Johnny Mathis. Johnny Mathis uh, was a, a singer. I, I'm not sure if he's still alive, but for those of us who grew up in the 60s and some people who may be around who came of age even earlier, Johnny Mathis was the record you put on when you want to get intimate or friendly with someone when you were a teenager, okay? It was because it was the, the vocalizations were in the frequency band mm. of a maternal lullaby. It was basically the essence of safety was being presented. And this took a burden off of either the, uh, the female or the male in the interaction because they didn't have to be convinced that they were safe. They could listen to the music and those cues were so potent that their defenses would start to uh, relax. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this actually is part of this whole metaphor that there are, one can literally use portals into our nervous system uh, that trigger safety. And some portals are more efficient than others. And the acoustic one, because babies and mothers use this, and in fact, your dogs use your voice. It's the same thing. If your voice is melodic and a little bit on the higher pitch side, they'll become more relaxed than if it's lower pitched and in a monotone, because mammals evolved to interpret automatically intonation of vocalizations because when mammals evolved they didn't have speech they had vocalizations and the vocalizations were wired mm -hmm. the nerves regulating vocalizations are wired to our heart so there is actually a different vagal pathway mm -hmm. so we are really projecting our heart in our voice and also comes up into our face so it's it, there's a neural physiology to this so when people say I really agree with everything you say, but I, I just don't like you. <laughs> you know, they're being extremely honest. They're saying that the intonation, the way the person presents the information is in a sense disrespectful to their nervous system. It's hmm. by, I use words like biologically rude. So if uh, we're engaged talking to each other, looking at each other, and suddenly I keep talking, but I turn 90 degrees and look at my watch, your body has a visceral response because it has an expectancy. Mm -hmm. Your nervous system has an expectancy of my interaction. That expectancy is another metaphor for our safety or feeling safe. We want predictability in interaction. And one of the predictability, one aspect is reciprocity. Huh. So <laughs> there's so many different angles to go here. Um, Let's, let's stay with some of these cues of safety uh, in that regard. So we're talking in terms of expectations and, and the, rest of, the expectation even of reciprocity uh, is part of the way that we create that co-regulation and get into that almost energetic dance, that harmony that, that occurs, right? Mm -hmm. What are some of those other cues of safety? Let's stay within the relationship realm or the, the, the interpersonal realm for, for the time being. Okay. Well, see, okay. we, the whole... Uh, agenda is to stimulate the social engagement system. Okay. So once we know what the social engagement system is in terms of structures, we know what to do. And some of them are more efficient than others. So the acoustic one is extremely potent. And that's that intervention safe and sound protocol that mm -hmm. you, you mentioned in the introduction. It functionally uh, is extracting what I think are the distilled or essence of safety in the vocalization. So we computer alter to amplify the prosodic features of vocal music that should make people feel safe. And that's what that does. Now, I will also tell you one caveat to that is that if people have severe trauma histories and their bodies start feeling safe, that's a different type of trigger to them to say, I'm vulnerable again. Mm -hmm. So now we have in a sense, an intervention that can be used within another trauma-oriented therapy or trauma-informed therapy that helps people uh, acknowledge and feel their physiological shifts and then mm -hmm. literally resolve that. Mm -hmm. So, so the the part of this, um, you're going to have to help me because I just lost where I was. No, problem. no <laughs> just, it's it's just the, the these cues. Oh, I, I got it. I got it. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. Um, okay, the inefficient one 
is ingestion. So what is another thing that people love to do when they want to be with someone else? They want to ingest food with them because it's the same, uh, it's mm -hmm. the oral motor cavity, which is now also has signals to that area of the brain that, that calms us down, yes. but not as efficiently as the acoustic pathway. Hmm. The other part that we like to use is our facial expressivity because we pick up facial cues of comfort and that goes into the same system that the listening one does. Right. So we start getting, because the branches of the facial nerve, one branch goes to the upper part of the face, the other one goes to the middle ear muscles. And so when people are able to process what others are saying, their eyes often become alive. And mm -hmm. so when you, you have a good relationship with someone, you see it in the upper part of their face. When you have a bad relationship with people, you see the muscles down below coming out. Interesting. And they're, they're, they're residual or vestigial from uh, biting and eating something else. So let me pull this back out again, because all of these, these different cues, uh, these different portals, and we're talking about facial expression, we're talking about ingestion, we're talking about the, the acoustic side, the audio side of this these all tap into the aspect of neuroception that you were describing before, right? So from yeah. a, a, that, the, the part of ourselves that is wired into our nervous system, that's picking up on these different cues before our brains are aware of, uh, yeah. cognitively aware of what's actually going on. Yeah. And the, the reason I'm bringing this up is that I think it's one of the things that, that you know, we'd love to talk about, whether from a coaching standpoint or a personal development or self-help or whatever standpoint, is that we always love to talk about, well, if we can control our thoughts, then we can control what we feel and we can control how we are, right? I can already see you smiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And so I'd, I'd love for you to just speak to, or, or yeah. just the re this recognition that, listen, guys, our wiring is so complex and there are things that are going on before our brains can even get involved. And so we've got to attend to that. Yeah, we, have, we can make it, we can say our wiring is so simple. <laughs> that, uh, like rather that. than make it complex, let's like make this a little easier. That certain things happen that we detect. We detect it on a bodily level. Mm -hmm. The problem is when our body reacts, we try to make sense of it and we try to create a complex narrative. So what people can do, since with neuroception, you seldom can be, a, you're seldom aware of where the signal is coming from or what the signal is. However, you're almost universally aware of the bodily reaction. Yeah. And it's that disconnect that forces our big brains and our creativity to develop narratives to justify what we do next. <laughs> okay, so we can be mad, we could throw something, we can be angry, uh, and we can, in our mind, justify it because we're feeling in our body a threat. But the threat may not be that other person. It may not be anything that people are aware of. Something right. as simple, where people are, in a sense, you could have a fragile person. If they walk up a flight of steps, their physiology now is more sympathetic. And now their bias in the social interaction is going to be reactive and defensive. Mm -hmm. And they're going to say potentially to you is, why are you angry at me? And you might be looking at them just in wonderment because they've walked up this flight of steps and their face is like that and your face drops a little and now they're interpreting their feelings yeah. based upon their your face. So this becomes really a common thing. So the issue with neuroception, it's outside of our awareness, mm -hmm. but our reaction to the cues is usually always in uh, part of our awareness. The question is, what do we do with that awareness? Yeah. That's where coaching, that's where therapy becomes useful. It says, you have these feelings. Let's listen to you talk about those feelings. Let's respect those feelings. Let's try to understand them. And then let's give you tools to regulate those feelings. You don't have to always play the clarinet to change that physiology. You can take some, uh, deep breaths, abdominal breathing, and exhale slowly. You can vocalize, you can chant, you can sing. You can even just sit and be with someone, be present so that your body now starts feeling safe. So the issue, again, within uh, the contemplative world and the therapeutic world, people talk about self-care now. It becomes a term. So what we're really saying is polyvagal theory gives you the justification to create a narrative of self-care. You know, it's, it's, 
I think it's one of the things, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit just from, from my own maybe personal background on this, is I think it's one of the things that I found in uh, diving deeper into my own mindfulness practice mm -hmm. was the ability to pick up on a lot of the cues, the physiological cues that were going on for myself. Yeah. Uh, I was somebody who lived in my head for a very long time. I wasn't even aware of some of what was going on. Yeah. And it, only until afterwards, once it was already you know, much bigger than it actually needed to be, uh, did I really become cognitively aware of what was going on. And so to be able to tap in and be much more aware, whether that's mindfulness practice, somatic practice, uh, yoga tendencies, Qigong, whatever it is that allows you to become more physically aware of your state mm. and what's going on for you, gives you what you're describing, that sooner point of awareness of when yeah. you're coming into contact with those responses so you can maybe take a pause, maybe take a breath. Yeah. Um, because of ex the other aspect of what you described is how quickly we can get caught up into a cycle of response with other people. And more of it might even be physiologically triggered than anything else that was actually occurring. Oh, I would say in general, that's true. And you can see this, any argument you, you have with a person, look at where their arms are. Look at the muscle tension in their arms. Yeah. Once the fists cl clench and the arms pull back, it's time to stop. Yeah. You know, there's no dialogue now. Yeah. And so the, the question is, we need to become aware that we're retracting and getting upset. And that is not the moment for interaction. What we also learn, basically from a polyvagal perspective, is that there's no such thing as winning an argument. <laughs> that that's not a discussion. That you don't, no, one's, no one is counting points. You're not making a point. All you're doing is upsetting the other person, making them more defensive and shifting their narrative yeah. to really emphasize that you are not supporting them. You're not present with them because you're not. You're already in another state. You're protecting your body. So this becomes really an important aspect of our own awareness of our bodily reactions. Well, this is interesting because this, this goes to something you brought up, which was uh, this relates to relationships. This relates to also something that can even be cultural within uh, the environment that we're in, the, the setting, the company, the family, or, 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 or otherwise we're in. What you're talking about, again, goes back to the difference you were making of an evaluative perspective yeah. or judgmental perspective versus one of witnessing and being with and being present with. And I mean, I think this is, we maybe quickly can start to surmise the importance of that in a one-to-one -one relationship. I've also heard you describe this from an academic setting, right? You, you've got to publish or perish, right? The old, the old phrase, right? Uh, and I'm just curious of just your, just your thoughts of the fact that we've got so many organizations and institutions that are based more on an evaluative model and keeping people a bit insecure. I, I think the whole- Promoting this. Yeah, well, I think it has to do with whether we respect the human, mm -hmm. the capacity of humans to quote, do the right thing, to be creative, to be productive, to be helpful, yeah. to be nurturing, to be all these things that we want, or do we think that humans are inherently evil and need to be uh, literally contained, not trusting what it is to be a human? I think our society is really tilted to the uh, level of saying, we need to teach the human a set of rules because humans aren't good. And that's what our bodies are reacting to. We're reacting to say, this is, how do I become good? What is it that I need to do? Uh, how will I be loved? And is being loved uh, accumulation of wealth? Is love publishing more papers? Is love getting more grants? You know, the, the world for me, within the academic setting, I, I always like to talk of myself as a survivor uh, within that because, uh, Academics has been very, very good for me and good to me. Uh, but it didn't mean that I was not aware of the price that's being paid to work on a day-to-day -day level in that environment. Right. And the price that was paid by many other people in that environment who did not have a meta view. I had a meta view to keep me out of there, a, a more global orientation that uh, there were things that I wanted to do in academics would be the only path, but there are parts of me that still want to be creative with outside that realm. But a lot of people just, that becomes their world. Right. And then the interesting part in academics is what happens at the end when you get older. And it's like, it's a very, I start to uh, contemplate this 
over 20 years ago, I started to look around at my older colleagues and ask the question, how do they transition? What are their lives like? And basically what happened for most, and this is senior men, uh, academics, for most of them, by the time they were, quote, pushed out because they were now too old or didn't have federal funding or were no longer productive thing, they felt totally unappreciated. Yeah. They felt that people no longer remembered them or respected them. And they felt they didn't get their due, which was really the common phrase used. Yeah. And I would think back and say, what are they talking about? they had opportunities to do things. Now it's time for other people to have opportunities. Why conceptualize the task in that way? And so I was trying to figure out what it was as a human being that enabled the transition to a feeling of success, a feeling of safety. Because what we're saying, I'm safe in my body, I'm safe in the world, because I functionally have done what I wanted to do. And I realized the big gap for me was in communication and translation. So it means that if you have ideas, how do you communicate them to people who can use them and how do you translate them into usable products? And this was really the, the last 15 years of, or maybe, yeah, last 15 years I've been really doing that. And now the ideas are into patents, they're into procedures, they're into techniques that are helping people. It's The patenting is not about finance. The patenting is about intellectual property so that ideas can be used. Yeah. And we get very confused in our world about what it is that we want, which is pulling to the chest, versus what we want to do for others in a more benevolent, open way. And so I, I figured for me, um, I was, as a faculty member, I was paid sufficiently. I had good research funding. I understood the, quote, game. I had federal grants. I published. I was accepted. I still am accepted. But that was not really what my goal was in life. My goal was now, can I take this information and translate it into a world that is useful, useful for others? And the so my world has become a world in which uh, social communication is really a major part of it, including the emails that I frequently get, not merely asking me to go on podcasts or do talks, but from, from survivors of trauma or parents of autistic children, reaching out, explaining their situations, talking about how polyvagal theory puts their life in perspective and how polyvagal theory in many ways has enabled them to stay alive because it took the craziness out of a spreadsheet of diagnosis and gave them an organizing principle that had both had a heroic uh, component. So it was their body trying to do the best that it could under those situations. So uh, one thing I just want to wrap up with what you just said, which I think is really interesting. And then I, I do want to just talk about one thing that, that I know that you're, you're currently working on, because I'd love to just get a little bit of information on this. Uh, before we wrap up, what you just shared, though, in terms of the the application of work, so that it is something that truly uh, can be passed along, it can be embedded in in other people's works and practices, and it has kind of a ripple effect of what it is that you're doing. I think the the, the perspective that I gleaned from that was not just the direct of what you were saying, but the indirect of those that haven't seen that kind of stay isolated in themselves. Whereas when you get into the application of ripple effect, that's where you're back into that kind of co-regulation, meaning you're, you're, you're into that you're, pay it forward to other people because we're wired to connect. We're wired you, to have that, that you, form you, of connection with people. You, you, you got it. You got it. The interesting part for me is to see my colleagues, the tragedy or sadness in many of them, because the public communication has no value to them. Yeah. They still want the love from the few people within the institute. Yeah. And that institute is not a loving institute. Right. So they're just, uh, in a sense, and they're getting older and some of them are dying and they're dying unfulfilled, feeling yeah. that, that they didn't get their due. And many of them, or I should say many, some of them are held in the greatest esteem in the public, but not in the university setting. And they would not allow those wonderful loving feelings from the public to help transform them. Mm. And so they were no longer, they weren't co-regulated. So your point yeah. is powerful that for me, 
these interactions, the interactions with you are co-regulatory for me. When I give talks or workshops, it's the feedback. I feel comfortable. Um, I will share one thing. I was giving a talk in London and I was standing in the lobby and a woman wheels up in a wheelchair and she comes up to me with a stern face and she says, you didn't say hello to me. I looked at her and I said, have we met? And she says, no, but I've watched you on YouTube. <laughs> and, and the point was what she was saying it was that we had a relationship. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, I, it, it, was, it was a moment to be, you know, open, accessible, and to be respectful of, yeah. of another person's feelings. And it was a beautiful yeah. moment. It is. That is. The, the, the one thing I just wanted to bring back up, because you had mentioned we were, you know, before we hopped on the line, so to speak, today, we were chatting about the fact that you're applying polyvagal uh, to addiction work. And I was just, yeah. I was wondering if you could say a few things because addiction is becoming more prevalent in different ways within society than I think ever before. Um, so I, I'm just curious about the way you're applying this because it's, it's popping up in so many areas. Yeah. Well, people have been contacting me and say, have you applied polyvagal theory to addiction? And I kind of like treat addiction as outside my world right. until a group wanted me to be involved in helping orchestrate a, an addiction treatment model that incorporated polyvagal theory. Hmm. And then I got involved and I realized what is addiction all about? It's all about state regulation. Hmm. It's all about not having resources to regulate your state, meaning not being able to co-regulate, using substances, using certain behaviors, even exercise as a major yeah. regulator, as opposed to people to people like maybe running with a friend or playing handball or something with another that has components of both. So I started to think about how would you create an addiction treatment model? You would give people breathing exercises. You'd give them resources. You'd give them biofeedback uh, opportunities. You'd use the acoustic stimulation that I developed in, in my, my program. You'd start giving them resources that are known to shift vagal regulation, in a sense to calm people down. And so that when they were losing state, they wouldn't go through an external resource, they would have the resource within themselves. And when you took, talk to people in the addiction area, they basically say that nothing really works. That it's, uh, I was talking to a group that runs many centers, and they said it's a great business plan because people keep coming back. Mm. But that's not what they want. They want to be able to treat people and give them resources that will keep them out of rehab or yeah. out of detoxification. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'm now working on is how does you structure an integrated treatment model that basically is polyvagal informed. It says that really if our physiological states can't get into a state of calmness, then we're going to start reaching for other things to regulate our physiology. Okay. Well, that is something that we're going to be, we're going to be watching. Uh, we're going to be watching the work and seeing what comes of it because I, that idea of what it is that allows us to regulate back to a, a, a place of safety, of calm, of centeredness, yeah. connectedness. It, it, I think the relevancy to so many people, whether they are truly struggling in the face of addiction from a disease standpoint, or whether they are struggling with other forms of, uh, addiction, and I, I don't want to necessarily make light of anything else, but with social media and media binging and, and, and yeah. workaholic and, and all of these types of ways that we're using activities or substance to mm -hmm. pull us away from what we don't want to experience. Yeah. It's, it's, it's just relevant to so many people right now. Yeah. Well, one thing about the media use and heavy media mm -hmm. use, uh, I'm involved in some research, which is actually showing that people who are using more media are exercising less, people know that, but they also have more trauma history. Yeah. So the issue is if you have trauma history, uh, what you're more less likely to do is to co-regulate with another person. Right. And so what's there for you? The media. So the media is, it, so if we were in a sense more, uh, I use the word forced or had more available yeah. co-regulation, even if people really don't want to relate that much, a little more of it would enable them to regulate their physiology. And in, again, in the world of uh, contemplative practices, that if we co-regulate, 
we shift our physiological state and then we have other emerging properties. We become more benevolent and we become more compassionate. And it's when we shift physiology to this more mobilized state, get the product out, work harder, do this, our pep talks, yeah. we lose our benevolence, we lose our capacity to be compassionate with another. Wow. Uh, Steve, Dr. Stephen Porges, uh, I just want to, I want to thank you so much for coming on One Idea Away. Uh, this work, I, I love seeing the cascade of what this work has gotten involved in because I do think it, it applies to just so many different fields and disciplines that are out there. Uh, and like I said, we will be paying attention for the work that you're doing in addiction because I think the relevancy, uh, again, to not only just the direct work, but the indirect work that will spill from that is going to be tremendous. Well, thank you very much. It's been a very pleasant interview. I enjoyed it. And your question got me to be creative and expressive. So thank you. Good co-regulate. Good co-regulate. Go good. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> So for, for everybody, I guess, you know, just a, a couple of wrap up thoughts, probably the first one that comes to mind uh, is that since we're a source of media, if you're listening or watching to this, uh, please do so with somebody else. Uh, use it to create a conversation uh, and, and get into the code regulation space. Um, in seriousness, I think that just there's such importance with understanding the ways in which we work as, as mammals, as human beings, uh, the way in which our, our physiology and biology works is an important part of us understanding who it is that we are. And the more that we can bring about those states of centeredness, of safety, of calm, the more that we can give cues to help support other people getting into those types of states as well uh, is a really important area for us to dive into and to understand because it affects our relationships, it affects decision making, it affects just the way that in any given moment we, we may choose to show up. And so uh, paying attention to these, looking for some of those things that help you to self-regulate in the moment of, to breathe, to get back to that state, and how it is that you can look at these co-regulating type of uh, patterns as well is something that you really, really, really will benefit your life. Uh, so I hope you do check out this work uh, a lot further. I hope you check out the work of Dr. Stephen Porges and polyvagal theory. Uh, you'll find a ton of his stuff also online and YouTube and things like that, as we were joking about. And so uh, with that in mind, everybody, I want to thank you once again for tuning into One Idea Away. And as always, continue to enjoy the journey. Thank you. Check out IPEX Coach Training Program at ipexcoaching.com slash OIA. And of course, to find out about all the conversations, events, gatherings, all the things that we've got upcoming, then head on over to oneideaaway.com forward slash community. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please do us the favor of subscribing, reviewing the show, as well as sharing insights or comments that stood out for you in this episode.